Almighty God, whose love and grace and mercy surround us on every side, fill this place and fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit that we might bring our worries, our fears, our anxiety to the one who invites us to do so, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. Good morning. Good morning to those of you in the pews and those of you uh, watching virtually. We've had a very busy full morning here at St. Martin's, and that's always a good thing. So last week, if you were here, I asked those of you who were seated in the pews, if you were worrying about something, to raise your hand. And in the three services that I asked that question, hands shot up like shakers at an SEC college football game. Hundreds of you fessed up. And then I promised you I would try to address that worrisome personal plague by turning to Scripture. And I also ask you to pray for me that whatever I offered would help. So I hope this does. So here we go. This past Tuesday evening, our Vice Rector Marty Bastian and I, we were talking about worry, thinking ahead a little bit, and we both remembered Alfred E. Newman, Do you remember who that is or who that was, I should say? Newman, the round-headed, red-haired teen with a wide gap in his front teeth, was, was born, if you will, in 1952. He had made previous appearances in advertisements for painless dentistry and even Theodore Roosevelt's presidential campaign. But he was literally adopted by Harvey Kurtzman, the creator and editor of very good Mad Magazine. So, so anybody here under the age of about 15, you're going to have to explain that to them later. But everybody else knows. Virtually every teenager known to humankind from the 1950s forward, found a way to get their hands on this satirical periodical and on every single issue, and I did my research, every single issue with the exception of two, there was the cartoon image of the smiling, freckle-faced Newman in one form or another. And the reason Kurtzman adopted this little fella was due to his countenance. He would write, that he was struck by the, and I'm quoting him, a face that didn't have a care in the world except mischief. And with good reason, I suppose, because the fictional Newman had a consistent motto for over 65 years, and that motto was, very good, very good class. (laughs) So for those of you who are at home, They got it right. What me worry was this motto. But note that I said Newman in the past tense because the what me worry kid was put to bed when the last issue of Mad Magazine was published in December of 2019. The timing was pretty appropriate right before COVID. (laughs) Newman's departure was uttered not with a lot of attention, but perhaps just kind of a whisper came that last issue. And I've wondered, obviously, why more was not made of a character, a cultural icon, if you will, that made his way into the hands of a generation or two of teenagers looking for some sense of distraction from the world, often in crisis, often beyond their control. And this is kind of where I've landed. I think It didn't get a lot of notice because many people are very, very uncomfortable with someone whose life's motto is, what, me, worry? Because worry, like misery, loves company. And we scoff at someone who would dare to say they have no worries, nothing about which to fret or fear because they know angst. They know anxiety. They know worry. So we'd rather just turn the page on little Alfred E. Newman and others like him than consider that he might have really been onto something. 
So what does our faith do the scriptures? Does our Lord have anything to offer those of us whose motto is not what me worry, but uh, worry, me worry all the time? Now, I confess to you that that preachers are often preaching to themselves. I've been known to be a perpetual worrier. When I was younger, I worried about different things, which job to take, which friends to make, how best to save, how best to spend. And now that I'm getting older, my worries have shifted. My children are grown now, but I still worry about them. My grandchildren, my health, provisions that I leave behind for my wife and the ones I love, and yes, St. Martin's and other places in which I believe. I'd be lying if I say I never worry, because I do worry. I worry about lots of things, lots of people. Do you worry? Don't have to raise your hands again. Do you worry? And yet then we have here in the gospel lesson, Jesus's words from the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Let's consider that last sentence again. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his or her life? Now, before I go on, just a few caveats to prevent some controversy at the door. Uh, so Jesus is not saying do not plan, right? The King James Version of the Bible actually translated this passage, passage with the words, therefore, take therefore no thought for the morrow. That's very poetic. And so many readers once interpreted this to mean that any planning around career ambition, financial and retirement planning, life insurance and such, all of that could be considered worry about the morrow. And therefore, it was actually sinful, antithetical to the Christian life. But that is not what Jesus is suggesting. A quick skim of the Gospels will tell you that Jesus was always planning for the future, putting down pavers to take one step after another toward the cross, toward the grave, toward his resurrection, and now toward his full kingdom. One might say that Jesus was a consummate planner. And Jesus was neither suggesting, do not be concerned. I do know people who do not get annual physicals. You should, by the way. There are those who do not exercise, who eat and drink without consideration to their health. There are those who have no will. And as someone who's done this for a long time, every one of you, if you have a family and loved ones, you should have a will. Now, don't wait. And always include St. Martin's in your will. As I have. As I have. There are those who text and drive. I almost got hit by a young girl over here driving over in the River Oaks area earlier this week. I love the sign. I actually read it outside of one of our Houston churches. It said, honk if you love Jesus, text and drive if you want to meet him. <laughs> do not worry does not mean do not care. We've been given bodies for which to care, relationships to which we must attend, lives that should be lived with character and integrity and nobility. And let's be honest, especially right now in 2023, I think we need to be concerned about the direction of our world. We need to be thinking about those who we plan to put into office. This isn't a political endorsement, don't worry, but we, we live in a time, in a city, in a nation, and a world that gives us plenty about which to be concerned. And we need to be informed and engaged and need to participate in one of God's great gifts to our nation democracy. If we have no concerns about the world beyond my little street address, 
then we need to recalibrate our souls because the good Lord spent a lot of time suggesting we are to make this world as much like his kingdom as we can. And that requires that we stay attentive and concerned and tuned in to those ways that we can make the kinds of differences the Lord would have us make. So do not worry does not mean do not care. So when Jesus says, do not worry, what does he mean? We need to think on that because worry, frankly, is a problem that's on the rise. We saw that last week in the show of your hands. The most recent Gallup polls in their 2022 annual negative index survey is what it's called, reported that roughly 41%, about four out of 10 adults in over 120 countries worldwide are plagued with worry at a near all-time high, which actually began about three years ago. Now, I followed up with an article about all this not too long ago, and, and the article was reflecting on this worry, and, and this is what the article said. Therapeutic studies reveal that when worrying becomes persistent, long-lasting, and difficult to control, it can seriously affect your daily life. And if unrelenting worry is accompanied by anxiety symptoms, such as irritability, difficult concentration, muscle tension, fatigue, and poor sleep, then that person may be suffering from something called GAD, Generalized Anxiety Disorder. Sign me up. That said, that said, the article that I read that was describing this GAD also offered some suggestions as to how to tackle it. But all of them are void of any reference to the kind of counsel that our Lord Jesus gives. And it ends with what I think was an underwhelming recommendation. This is how it ends. Following self-help books, videos, and apps can be very beneficial. The end. I would say that's precisely the problem. Jesus' counsel is not to depend on yourself to escape the weight of worry. It is instead to turn to God. It's not self-help we need, it's God's help. You recall what the self-made man said to God when he was ushered into the kingdom of heaven. He said, if I had to do it all over again, I'd call in for some help. I suspect the reason that anxiety and worry are on the rise is that we live in a culture increasingly infatuated with itself. And if you don't believe that, take a good look around the restaurant the next time you go. And how many people are looking at themselves in the phone and they're taking pictures of themselves on their phone? A growing number of people have the belief that they don't really need God. They don't really need church. They don't need the sacraments. They don't need to read the scriptures. Why bother with prayer? I think St. Martin's is an exception. Look around but we need to guard this exception. But in general, attendance at church in many places around the world continues to decline. Is it any wonder that as that has decreased, worry and anxiety have increased? The problem with suggesting that the answer to our worry problem is the man or the woman in the mirror is that the one looking back at us is the one who's burdened with worry. So what to do? Jesus says, do not worry. Remember, remember what? Remember that you are not in this alone. You have a place to take your worries. You have one to whom you can turn. And that's precisely what we hear in the lesson from 1 Peter that David read a moment ago. Humble yourselves. In other words, it ain't all about you. Therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Humble yourself, that he may lift you up. In other words, confess your need of God's help, and he'll begin to lift you up. Peter was writing to a church, to the body of Christians, already witnessing tremendous persecution, likely under Nero, being arrested and imprisoned and tortured and martyred. And all of those were real possibilities to those reading Peter's words. And yet he says here, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Say that again. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 
Jesus' teaching is not, absolutely not suggesting you will not face trials and troubles. You will. We all will. What he is saying is that you do not have to face them alone. And he's also reminding you that worrying about things over which you have absolutely no control negates the offer of his companionship. One of my favorite Christian authors, the late Corey Ten Boom, a Holocaust survivor, wrote, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Again, to go back to that article, if in the end, your escape from worry just comes down to self-help, then frankly, we're all done for. But Jesus makes it clear, as does Peter. Jesus says, you matter to God. And because you do, you're not without resources. He tells those hearers on the Sea of Galilee to look how God tends to the birds of the air. If he's going to take care of them, he's surely he's going to take care of you. If you flip over to Luke chapter 12, verse 6, Jesus says this, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground without the knowledge of your heavenly father. Indeed, Jesus continues, the very hairs of your head are numbered to this haunting, gnawing fear that we may be alone, that we do not matter. Jesus speaks, choosing three of the most insignificant things in his day, a penny, a sparrow, and a hair. A penny in Jesus' day was the smallest bit of currency. It was, it was about one-sixteenth of a denarius a day's, a day's wage. A penny could buy you in Jesus' day two sparrows. Here Jesus says, two will buy you five. Pointing to the habit that sometimes the merchant would throw in a fifth sparrow for free because they weren't really worth anything. Here, you bought four, have a fifth, no charge. God cares, Jesus says, even for the fifth sparrow. And if he cares for sparrows, he cares for you. Not one of us spends time counting the hairs on our head, not even those of us with ever-expanding bald spots. None of us has the tally of follicles on your body. Do you? Does anyone? God does. That's Jesus' point. God knows you better than you know you. Why insignificant things? Why a sparrow? Why a penny? Why a hair? What use are they? They're so cheap, so little value. The very reason he uses these examples is because we sometimes feel as worthless as that fifth sparrow. Disposable, dispensable, ignored. Maybe your worries have you feeling the same way. There's no hope. There's there's no use. I'm on my own. But friends, you are not on your own. We've been singing that great little tune since we were old enough to toddle. He's got the whole world in his hands. And if he's got the whole world in his hands, does that not include you? Well, of course it does. So what to do? Peter tells us, cast all, not some, but all, of your anxiety, where? On him. Why? Because he cares for you. Now, how do you do that? Practically, really, how do you do that? Here you go. Sometime this afternoon, get in a quiet place. For goodness sake, turn off the news. I bet if you all turned off the news for a week, you would feel less anxious. Take a fast from the news. That wasn't in the sermon, that's just... Thank you, Lord. That was from the Lord to you. This afternoon, make a list. You can use your sermon notes page if it's not already full with extraordinary notes that you've been taking. So make a list of, about, and put on there all those things that you're worried about. Then note those things about which you can do something. You have a bill coming, find a way to pay it. You got an ache in your side, set up that doctor's appointment. You dread coming face to face with that coworker or your ex. Well, schedule that coffee. You can do something about those things, so do something. This is why, friends, daily prayer, and I mean daily prayer is so important. You can sit before our Lord and you can create, if you will, a kind of daily inventory, those places, those things 
in which you need God's guidance, his help, his strength. But what about those other things? And there are other things. What's going on overseas? The greater Houston economy. What's going to happen to your children? Your grandchildren? How and when will you die? What will happen to the things you leave behind? All those what if questions you ask. Well, let's be honest. There's not a lot you can do about those, is there? So here again is where daily prayer is so important because it not only puts before you those things wherein you might be able to do something, but it also reveals to you the list of the things over which you have absolutely no control. So those, my friends, those worries, those fears, those things, cast them on him, give them to him, turn them over to him, cross them off of your list one by one because they do not belong to you anymore once you have given them to him. They belong to God. Now, chances are, if you're doing it even right now, as soon as you step outside this door, they're all waiting out there to jump on your back again. And that's why that daily prayer, that daily practice is so important. What might it really look like? Well, George, George McCaslin directed the YMCA facility in Pittsburgh and the job began to eat him up on the inside. He was struggling with work. Membership was on the downward spiral. His facility was operating in the red, had high debt. He had some huge staff problems. People came to work at the Y to work off their tension. Where did he go? It wasn't long before he was behind his desk at 85 hours a week. And when he did come home, he was too tired to sleep. Some of you know exactly how that feels. He was up all night thinking about the next day. Vacations were few. When he was away, he was always thinking about the why. His therapist told him that something had better give because a nervous breakdown was on the way. And that's when George began to think about God. Where did God fit into this unhappy, anxious, worry-filled picture? So he scheduled an afternoon off from work. George drove to the western Pennsylvania woods, a place he associated with peace and tranquility. He took a long walk, trying to empty his mind and concentrate on the fresh air and the pleasant aromas of the slightest few ounces of tension. He began to feel slightly draining away. He sat down beneath a tree. He pulled out a notebook he brought along and he breathed a long sigh. This was the first time in months he felt anything close to relaxation. George felt as if he and God had grown apart. So he decided to write God a letter. Dear God, he began, today I hereby resign as general manager of the universe. And he read it back to himself. And then he just signed it, Love George. He's turned this into a story he tells others, and now he laughs when he tells the story, and he likes to add this. And you know what happened? God accepted my resignation. Back to dear old Corey Ten Boom, who wrote, Worry is an old man with a bended head, carrying a load of feathers, which he thinks are lead. Worry about things you cannot control is actually, I think, the Holy Spirit reminding you that you need to remember you are not alone. You need to turn your worries over to God. There's no one better or more capable of handling them for you than God is. I'm going to close with this story, and I, I hope you'll take it home as you exercise your little homework assignment. This is a friend of mine. He's a pastor. Told me this story years ago about a time he took his young daughter with him on a trip up to Chicago. They were staying in a tall hotel downtown, decided to spend the afternoon at a local museum, it was a pretty day, so the two of them kind of walked hand in hand. They had a great afternoon together. And yet when they came out, the sun had set, and my friend, see, he was a bit disoriented. 
he didn't want to let that onto his daughter. And so he, he took her by the hand and he, he walked as if he knew right where he was going. Didn't want her to let on, but he realized he had turned down one wrong street again. So he turned back and started over and only to get turned around once more. And this happened a few more times. All the while, he did not let go of his daughter's hand, but inside he was wondering if they would ever find their way back to the hotel. But then finally he turned the right block and he saw the hotel and they made their way back and he decided to treat her to dinner in the restaurant. And in an attempt to kind of fess up as her dad, he said, honey, you might have noticed daddy got a little bit turned around today. Yep, his daughter said, but that didn't scare you? No, nope, his daughter said, you weren't frightened? You weren't, you weren't worried? No, dad. Well, I might have been if I were you, he said, trying to give her a little room to be honest. I wasn't scared, dad, because I was with you. Here's the deal. God is always, always with you. His grace and mercy and presence surround you on every side. You just need to have the confidence, the faith, if you will, of this little girl who was not afraid because she knew her father would never turn her loose, would never let go of her hand, and neither Neither will your heavenly father. I love the verse from Isaiah 49, 16, God's word to his beloved. I have you engraved on the palm of my hand. So my friends, what to do with your worry? Just this. Consider giving God a gift today. Give him your worries. He invites you to do so. He asks you to do so. In fact, he compels you to do so. Why? Because you matter to him. The very hairs on your head are numbered by his divine fingers. You are not without hope. Let today be a new beginning Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He really does. And because he does, you can give God your worry. Amen.